Welcome to Introduction to Agroecology. We're going to go over part one of unit 12, which is going to talk about the principles that guide the development of sustainable agroecosystems. And basically, we're going to look at things we're doing that we should use in terms of coming up with uh, sustainable methods that are going to help us in the future to produce the food we need to. Here's a picture of um, ecosystem that's divided. And remember, an ecosystem can be divided in many ways. But in this example here, it's showing um, the Indiana dunes. And right up at the top, you can actually see Lake Michigan, the bottom of it, and the actual sand. But this is all areas that the um, when they put the interstate through, uh, they actually took part of the ecosystem. And you'll see that the ecosystem can still exist. And in some cases, it's not exactly what you want it to be, but it can still be an ecosystem. Even though it's part of the one closest to the lake, it's still it's considered a separate ecosystem because of the breaks in between. Um, some of the things in terms of uh, we're, what we're going to go over for sustainability in our agroecosystems is that Agriculture is a the human manipulation of energy in the ecosystems that we have. In other words, each farm is an ecosystem, and what are we doing to change it from what it was naturally? Um, we're going to use that in terms of how do we create the food, the fiber, uh, to feed the people, and then the fuel we use to, in order to do that. So it's looking at all those aspects of it. And what are things we can do to make it better for the long term that is going to be able to go on forever and ever, or at least longer than we believe it will now if we don't change it. Um, agriculture, um, we've needed it. In other words, we've needed to eat since the beginning of time. So they used to go out and hunt, and they grew their, for their own areas. And then it evolved into, as it became more mechanized, that we needed more and more energy in order to produce the crops that we use today or how we produce the crops uh, for the food that we have to eat. Uh, we have to talk about ways that we reduce energy since we're using so much, since it's become mechanized to control non-crop plants. We need to talk about how we use herbivores or animals to eat the plants and how that will help us. And then we have to talk about how we uh, plant cultivate and then harvest those crops using less mechanized means, using less energy. Here's a, a picture of uh, down in South America where they're actually using uh, mechanization. You can see how much equipment it is. The piece of equipment off on the right is the, uh, the crop is sugar cane, and it's a combine-like thing that comes and processes and grabs the sugar cane and then puts what it's putting in here is the byproduct of it, which is all the leaves that aren't used, not the cane itself, but the leaves. So and it's just showing that they have a lot of equipment that they use it. And here they are harvesting it. And instead of just throwing it, they put some on the field. It comes and gets the rest of it. So there's a lot of equipment that's necessary uh, in order to do that. Um, we also, once we become more mechanized, we're using uh, less renewable energy. We're using what we need to do is become more uh, dependent on renewable forms of energy as opposed to using oil as our base product uh, for all this mechanization. The amount that we use um, to produce higher year yields has not always been worth the benefit that we've achieved. In other words, we've expended much more in terms of how much we need energy we need to produce it than we get in terms of what the crop is worth. So that certainly isn't a sustainable process that you can continue on and on and on. At some point, it's not going to be worth doing that. Here's an example of the way it used to be when it was very uh, sustainable and the mechanization was not very much. I mean, you had horses pulling a plow in this case that we're seeing here, and this was way back probably in the 20s or 30s. Um, but the guy, the farmer is actually walking on that. You certainly wouldn't see that with the me mechanization we have today. They're always in combines or tractors or some piece of equipment like that. Um, what we're also going to be looking at is some of the current methods that we use for raising. In this case, we're talking about animals and how that it's not very sustainable, that we're creating more and more pollution uh, for our water and the air we're breathing. 
Um, there's an example or problems with uh, manure that we're not using it as a res resource anymore that we used to. Uh, and they're actually just piling it up and uh, it's becoming a big pollution issue. Uh, pastures no longer exist even if they were out there, they're now being plowed under and being used for, you know, some type of crop. Uh, and the farms are becoming more commercialized. In other words, they're being owned by larger and larger entities. And there's not the family farm that we used to. So we'll look a little bit at the social aspect of what changes are occurring with that. Um, and then in corn and soybeans, which are the predominantly the two major crops we have, that we're using too much acreage for them to feed the animals that we're, that we're uh, growing and that we should be using more of that crop we're getting to feed humans and less animals. If we use the old non-sustainable ways, uh, or excuse me, the sustainable ways we used to of the past and we had the uh, animals out in the pasture, we would be using less of that corn and soybean to feed them. Uh, for the family farms, uh, for, you know, looking at it, the crops and animals used to be integrated and that created a synergy of a uh, different ecosystem than what we have today. And we'll talk about how changes to that can bring back beneficial things that are uh, no longer there. Um, we need to reintegrate the plants and animals for this to occur and try to use the animals to our advantage and, and not to its detriment because we're only using them to create the, uh, the feed we need or the milk we need and then that's it. And we're also gonna look for ways that creating those synergies that create relationships that will make stuff so that we're doing things on a more local level as opposed to a regional or a global level. Uh, here's an example of uh, in these are uh, cattle that are in, I believe this is South Africa, but it's just they're out in the pasture. And um, in this case, they're probably getting wrangled up to be coming in for the night from the pasture. Um, some of the things are energy inputs for creating our food. Um, we have a ton of human labor. Uh, animal labor, there's a lot of, there's a lot of machines that are being used to produce our food that we eat. And then because we've changed all that and it's become more mechanized, and this is a lot of the stuff off the farm, but it still is affecting the energy we use for those machines and tools from the seeds and fertilizers to irrigating, then the food processing that's off the, off the farm part where at some plant somewhere. And then we have to take that once it's been produced, we have to get that out to uh, closer warehouses and then the grocery stores or convenience stores or wherever else you might buy it uh, to eat and consume. Um, we need to look at the use of solar energy um, because it's the starting point of, and it's basically it doesn't cost us. So we have to learn how to use that in a better fashion in order to produce the crops that we're having. Um, it's, we talked about this in an earlier unit of the course, but basically the sunlight's captured by the plants, it's a photosynthesis that happens, and that's referred to as primary production. Uh, and then after it goes through the respiration, which that is where it releases the water that's uh, in the plants, that's referred to as net primary production. But basically it takes that sun and it gets rid of some of the water, but it keeps part of it to store it as a biomass. The biomass would be a cob of corn, the corn that you actually produce or the soybean or the wheat that's on the uh, wheat plant that you use for when you're harvesting. And then we take part of that plant that isn't the biomass that humans would eat and the uh, animals will then use that as feed. Uh, sometimes they'll use the part that we eat too. We talked a couple slides earlier about that there's a lot of, uh, we have corn fed beef, for example. A lot of corn is used to feed beef. Um, here's an example of in Africa where this is current day. This is a, the uh, method that they're using right now. Uh, they don't have all the mechanization, although they're becoming more and more um, being pushed to look at the mechanization from uh, different companies and groups that are going over there trying to help them 
uh, become better. But here's just an example of using the uh, cattle to plow the field. Um, industrial energy, energy inputs, um, many don't have a positive effect. In other words, the, the energy you need in another, the oil that you use probably isn't that efficient. It's certainly not renewable, so there's an issue with that. And when we're doing it, um, there's a, a certain amount of people that are starting to believe that going back to using animals is much more effective and energy efficient. Although on a large farm, that would take a tremendous amount of time to, uh, to do what we do today, how we do it. Also with the industrial energy, the mechanization, um, if we look at what's happened from 1945 to about 1983, they increased the amount of product that was produced threefold. Uh, the basic reason for that was, was that the corn itself was able to grow better than what it was. Um, but there, to, in terms of how we're looking at it from this angle is the mechanization by using tractors and compounds, or combines, we were able to harvest plant and harvest more product. Um, there were irrigation systems that helped us produce better crops because you irrigated it at the right time to make sure it had the water at the right growing points. And then we're also using with mechanization of transporting those foods because as we go uh, further and further on, we are producing more and more foods farther and farther away from our table. So it takes a lot more energy to get it there. <clears throat> um, using the, the reason we're trying to become more sustainable that because the cost of that energy is starting to make it so it's not as economically feasible as it used to be in the past and when we create to when we go to create and produce the food process it into whatever we type of food we want to take take the corn or soybean and make the food we eat and then they got to transport it and market it it's getting to a point where that's becoming very, very expensive and our food is tremendously expensive. There is a belief that by going back to how we used to do it and do things closer to home that we are going to substantially reduce the cost of the food that we consume. Um, one of the problems we have to make ourselves more sustainable is that we need to do a lot more to try to control erosion because there's a lot of problems with um, soil being moved from places it shouldn't, from nutrients um, being um, going off the land at a rate faster than they're coming on. And here's an example of trying to control the erosion with strip cropping. And basically the green areas are the grassy areas and then there's areas in between which you grow plants and it's in areas where it's, it's designed to stop the when water comes down for it to be washing out the soils or the uh, soil and the nutrients that are in the soil. Um, one of the problems we have and we need to use for getting rid of our dependence on fossil, fossil fuels is that our seed quality or soil quality, excuse me, is declining because we've used more fertilizer. In order to produce at the rates that threefold increase between the 40s and the 70s or 80s, um, was because in order to keep up with it, we need to use artificial fertilizer, the synthetic fertilizer, in order to make it grow how we want. Um, when a result of doing that, there's been a reduction in the biodiversity um, because we have needed to use pesticides because we have more and more pests around that we believe that we have to eliminate the pests um, that we are getting. And then because we're using the fertilizers and we have a reduction in biodiversity, there's more nutrient leaching because of the change in what the quality of the soil is. So this has resulted in an increase in soil erosion. Some of it was due to the fact that we have become more mechanized and we're, the equipment we were using. Uh, some of it's due that we're leaving fields open, that they used to have cover crops like uh, alfalfa and wheat that they'd have on the fields and they wouldn't leave just open dirt and we don't do that as much uh, anymore. So that's part of the reason we have an increase in soil erosion. Some more reasons of why we're having problems with soil quality is the uh, amount of available water. 
and with a lot of the amount of available water going down, in other words, we aren't getting as much rain or we don't have enough water to irrigate if that's what we were doing, the um, soil is getting more and more compact so it's not as uh, malleable as it used to be, in other words, workable. Um, we're be becoming, it's becoming an issue that some water supplies are being polluted due to the fertilizers we're putting on there. So that's become an issue. Um, there, because we're using all these artificial means, and, and not totally because diseases and pests have always evolved over time, <clears throat> and they learn to beat whatever um, enemies there, that they want to be there. A disease or a pest wants to be there and do what damage it can. It wants to live just like we want to use the food off the land. And because we have an ever-increasing um, increase in use of those pesticides, uh, what basically happens is that these diseases and pests have built up a resistance, just like when you take medicine, it'll work for so long and then it won't anymore. Your body learns to adjust and say, hey, I'm not going to let that, you know, get rid of that problem of whatever you're using the medicine for. Um, increased use of pesticides have also contaminated the farms and ecosystems. And the reason for that is, is you can't always put on the right amount of a pesticide. And sometimes you put it on at just the wrong time, it rains and it washes off. So that's getting into our ecosystems and changing the uh, makeup of what's there. And then we're getting more nitrogen in the atmosphere and that's caused uh, damage to our ozone layer. And we've talked about that in a prior uh, unit also. Um, some of the economic and social viewpoints and issues of why we should be looking toward a sustainable future is that there's um, been a huge fluctuation in fossil fuel prices. And of course, that's going to make a big difference in how much money that the farmer makes. Also, as it increases, is how much more we're going to pay for the food that we get because it takes so much to get it to our uh, table. Um, Social viewpoints, the next one where we've displaced families to urban areas. Um, that means that they're no longer working on farms or in, in rural areas. So we have to start providing more jobs in those areas and that's become an issue. But also you've changed a little bit um, in terms of families being broken apart. In other words, some of the family might have moved off the farm. Um, real controversial area, but it's something they're at least looking at to say, hey, we're, we're the fabric of rural America has changed completely than what it was 40 years ago. I'm not so sure that 40 years before that, the social fabric was a lot different than 40 years ago. So if we look at it, it's probably always changing. Um, it's also changing what the cultures are like when we're going into these undeveloped countries and we're starting to mechanize them. They're starting to look at stuff differently in terms of what they can have that they never have looked at before. And it's causing some social issues there too. Uh, and the last point is altering the number of people able to be self-sufficient. In other words, when you were a farmer, the whole idea was you created your whole existence and you were self-sufficient. Um, that really hasn't been the case in a lot of years, but in developing countries, it's really changed the fabric of what that's like because um, there weren't a lot of people that were self-sufficient and um, becoming more of that is, is helping out too. Um, some of the things we can do to become more sustainable is instead of using fossil fuel, the oil, that we can start using uh, biological fuels or biofuels. And here's an example of switchgrass. And it's different things they're um, looking at in order to be able to replace the fossil fuels. And the whole idea is to grow a, a field of this and then produce uh, fuel from that, a biofuel. Um, some of the future directions of moving towards sustainability, we need to use energy more effectively. In other words, we're using way too much. We need to find ways that we can save the use of energy. And then we need to reduce, reduce the uh, reliance on industrial energies or fossil fuels. And then, of course, that would mean probably using biofuels as an alternative. We could also do use uh, the use of legumes, which is going to 
by putting that on, that's alfalfa in this case here. And what that would allow you to do is you build up the nitrogen in the soil, therefore you'd be using less fertilizer, and that would be a very good thing. Um, and then some of the stuff and moving towards it, of why it would be a good idea, the local availability. In other words, reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are necessary to produce that food, have it locally, and you don't have to move it around to as many places. Uh, it won't affect the environment as much because if you're using less fossil fuels, you're going to have less um, pollution. And if it's close to you, in theory at least, you should be able to control it, whereas now you have no control over the different things. So where it's used, who gets it, how you get it, and how you use the food is uh, controlled more locally, which in theory will be a better thing. <coughs> And then studies indicate that we should be um, using animals and green legumes, and that would tremendously help us to become less dependent on the fossil fuels and more sustainable. And studies have shown that if you reduce fossil fuel use, you have a reduced energy use total of a decrease of 75%, which is a huge amount. Um, some of the possible options that we can use for change it is to reduce the fossil fuel use, crop rotation, which would mean the use of legumes in that rotation, which would add the nitrogen, as we talked about a few slides, a couple slides back. There's also no-till methods, which are not opening up the land. You just plant the crop and you harvest the crop, and you have a planter that will actually open the land, put the seed in, and close it, and there's minimal loss of soil. And then um, reintroduce non-crop areas into the cropping system, um, and that's going to increase wildlife habits. That would be um, one of the hedgerows that we have talked about that they had gotten rid of, and that's bringing that wildlife back in. If you bring wildlife, you're going to bring other insects that could be beneficial, and it's also going to be helping out with the biota of the soil, in other words, the living portions of that soil, and that's the beneficial organisms. Uh, and then the insects, like I said, would come back because of the wildlife. Um, you can also use animals and fields to provide organic matter. In other words, their waste from after they eat um, to use increase the nitrogen. Um, you'll also reduce the waste problem issues we have with the feedlots since they aren't doing anything with the manure. Um, they're just putting it in piles. It'll get it back out. And the, pro and the reason they're doing that is it would cost too much money because the feedlots aren't close to where they could spread the manure on uh, fields. It costs too much to do it, and that's why it's not being done. Um, we can use plant byproducts to help maintain the fertility of the soil. In other words, when we harvest, we leave the more of the crop residue there. Um, we reduce the distance of transporting products. That's using stuff more locally. So they're going to, what we, they believe is you should be purchasing products uh, more locally instead of having stuff come from everywhere else. And then maximize the use of uh, the local ecosystem you know, when you're creating the new models. In other words, look around you in areas that haven't been disturbed and what parts of that should we be trying to use in order to get um, our ecosystem to be better, the one you're working with. Um, here's an example of the crop residue left in the field. Here's the new year and we see corn coming up, but what's here also, and here's an example of that's old corn, the old corn stalk. So they're planting the same thing two years in a row. But not quite, not totally sustainable, but at least a move in the right direction because you're leaving that residue there. Um, some of the things if we're moving towards that we need to diversify versus having a monoculture. So that prior slide when corn two years in a row, we need to do that crop rotation. That's an important thing to put those nutrients back in the soil. Um, using natural approaches uh, to reinvigorate or restore soil nutrients without using synthetic materials. In other words, using legumes, doing that crop rotation with alfalfa or wheat every third or fourth year um, and putting 
manure on the field and that's going leaving the residue on the field that's all things that's going to be a natural approach which will be better and, and produce crops um, using less energy and certainly there wouldn't there would be less pollution uh, running off the using use of cover crops and that's just a crop you'd put in over the winter time that would help restore nutrients kind of like using alfalfa or wheat and then another thing that's just coming about it's used more in tropical areas but the use of perennial crops and a perennial crop corn and soybeans are a annual crop in other words every year you have to replant that there are some crops that are being grown and certainly corn and soybeans are not one of them that it's going to be a perennial plant there forever or in theory forever at least multiple years and the idea is that you can keep getting your uh, crops off of that every year there's just no crops for the monoculture of what we use that's possible at this point, but they're looking at things that we could use. Uh, here's an example of a cover crop, um, and the farmer's just out checking on, on how it is, and he just has a field that he planted it. That's going to put a lot of nitrogen in the ground um, for when he's probably going to plow that under or disc it under in the spring and plant, you know, corn, soybeans, or some other crop. Looking at biofuels, there are possibly some issues with it, and a lot of times the energy balance between the two aren't a positive swap. And an example, um, to produce a thousand liters of ethanol, it requires 8.0 million, and uh, kcal is just a measure of how much energy it takes, and it doesn't matter to understand what a kcal is exactly. But what's important is that it takes 8.3 million kcals energy units to produce a thousand liters of ethanol, but it only produces um, the 5 million kcals of product. So you can see that you're actually losing doing it. The reason we're doing ethanol production is that it's being subsidized by the government. And because it's being subsidized, Maybe we'll get more efficient at doing this over time and it will pay, but right now it doesn't pay because the amount of corn that you need is actually more than the amount of production that you get out of it or benefit. A little food for thought is the longer it takes us to develop these alternatives to the fossil fuels, the more vulnerable we're going to become. And by vulnerable, I mean that if we get to a point they say by 2050 we're not going to have enough resource to produce the food we need to feed the population of the world at that time. If that's true, then we're going to have a lot of issues about everybody wanting whatever crops we're producing. So the better off, the more we're able to get rid of those fossil fuel uses, and that's probably one of the things that we'll do. If we run out of fossil fuels, we'd really have a problem. And who's going to control it? I mean, right now, the U.S. does control a tremendous amount of fossil fuel reserves. Um, but if the world was starving and wanted stuff, who knows what that might cause? So just something to think about. And then here are a list of all the attributions we had for Unit 1 of, uh, or Part 1 of Unit 12.